everyone! So, continuing the award season coverage, today on the channel I'm going to be predicting the BAFTA winners. That's right, going to be going through all 25 of the categories and giving my thoughts and analysis on who I think the winners are going to be this year. Do get involved in that comment section down below. I want to hear your predictions for the BAFTAs and I want to hear what you think of mine. But before we dive in, I just want to introduce you guys to my newest little friend. His name is Bonbon. Bon. Hello, darling. And he is the newest addition to our little Gluk Famalam and oh, I'm absolutely in love with him. He's a, such a little purr machine. He's so sweet and playful. Oh, and he's gonna be a right little nuisance now as I try to record content, aren't you? Aren't you? Yes, you were. God, I'm in love. I will be doing a BAFTA reactions video on February 18th. So if you don't wanna miss that, uh, click subscribe and turn the little bell for all my award season content. Anyway, let's jump right in. Gonna put my cat down. <laughs> Not my shoe, play with your mice. I'm gonna kick things off with the EE Rising Star Award because this is the only category of the evening which is decided by the British public. It's not decided by you know, a BAFTA committee or anything like that. With this category, it usually goes to someone who has a big social media following, i.e. they have a lot of fans who are willing to vote for them. If you're British as well, that also is a considerable advantage here. And also, if you've been in a big franchise movie, like a Bond movie or a Marvel movie or a Star Wars movie, that can help you out as well because you've been in something big, which means you've had a lot of exposure to the public. You know, people vote for what they know and have seen. So yeah, past winners of this have been Eva Green, who was in a Bond movie, John Boyega, Star Wars, Letitia Wright and uh, Tom Holland, both in Marvel movies. And of course, we just had Lashana Lynch a few years ago, who was also in a Bond movie. Ah, you little tiger, you little terrorist, yeah. Oh, you are just causing chaos, aren't you? Sorry, he's just jumping on the box where my iPad is recording this. So yeah, that's why the camera might be a little wobbly in places. You are just full of energy, aren't you? Now, last year, this went to Emma Mackey, whose most notable project was probably Sex Education. Yeah, this was pre-Barbie, but yeah, she still managed to win because, you know, Sex Education was very popular and she had a big social media following as well. Normally with this category, I would predict someone British to win in it, which would mean uh, this bunch would either be Phoebe Devonair or Mia McKenna Bruce. However, I can't help but shake the feeling that Jacob Elordi is going to win this because the Aussie actor has been in so many projects this year, like Priscilla, Euphoria, and of course, Saltburn. Saltburn has had a rather large splash in the UK anyways. Definitely one of the most talked about movies of the year, and it is a British film. It opened the BFI Film Festival. The public ate that film up, and it did pretty well at BAFTA. It got five nominations, and three of those were acting nominations, and one of those was for Jacob Elordi, and Best Supporting Actor. So, I think the fact that he is the only nominee in the Rising Star category who has a nomination, you know, in an actual uh, competitive acting category this year does give him a slight edge. I think uh, he is the one to take this home. <laughs> Plus, Jacob Elordi is hot right now. Like, literally. <laughs> he is an attractive man. People are really crushing on him hard, thirsting over him on the internet. And yeah, um, because he's hot and popular, you know, people like voting for things that are pretty. <laughs> so it makes a lot of sense that he would win here. Like the fact that he's the only guy in the category as well really does make him stand out amongst these, this pack of ladies. So yeah, I do think Jacob Elordi will take this, but if a Brit were to surprise here, I think maybe Mc Mia McKenna Bruce has a chance here because you know, she really has exploded this year with the success of How to Have Sex. But the reason I think she's not winning it is because this is voted for by the public. And Jacob Lordy has been around a bit longer. He's probably a bit more popular, been, a bit seen, been seen in more things than me and McKenna Bruce. And yeah, this isn't, this isn't voted for by you know, a BAFTA committee or even critics. It's voted for by the public. So it's essentially a popular vote. So yeah, you just gotta go who you think is the most popular, I think. And to me, Jacob Elordi ticks the most boxes. He makes the most sense. So yeah, I'm gonna predict Jacob Elordi. And if he does win, he'll be the first non-British person to win this category since Kristen Stewart won in 2009. The salt burn effect strikes again. Okay, so next up we have actor in a lead role. And the obvious pick for this category is Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer got the most nominations of any film at both BAFTA and the Oscars. It got 13 at both. And I am expecting Oppenheimer to continue its award season dominance at the BAFTAs. I think it will be the biggest winner of the night at BAFTAs. Last year, the most nominated film at BAFTA was the biggest winner on the night. That was All Quiet on the Western Front. It was nominated for what, 14, ended up taking seven home. 
And I do expect Oppenheimer to take home the most trophies on BAFTA night, and I think it actually might win maybe one more than All Quiet on the Western Front's Hall. I think Killian Murphy winning at BAFTA makes a lot of sense. He's highly respected, he's been doing incredible work for years on Peaky Blinders, and he's finally found that perfect leading man role in a beloved film where he really got to showcase his skill set to the world. And it's one of those performances where he does so much acting with just his eyes, like he conveys so much just through his ocular performance, if you will. Like, it's more impressive, I think, than, you know, a very physical performance like Bradley Cooper in Maestro. That wasn't shade, by the way. I still think Cooper's is a good performance. But yeah, with Oppenheimer's box office success, as well as its front runner status in the Best Picture and Best Director categories, it just makes sense that Killian Murphy would come along as part of uh, the Oppenheimer bundle because he is Oppenheimer, okay? A lot of the movie rests on his shoulders. But I'm not gonna say it's a done deal. I do think there is a slight chance that Paul Giamatti could surprise here at BAFTA for his performance in The Holdovers. The Holdovers did better than expected at BAFTA. It got seven nominations. Three of those were acting nominations and also showed up surprisingly in the Best Director category as well. The film is clearly liked by BAFTA and Paul Giamatti is someone who's very well respected in the industry. Um, he hasn't actually been nominated a BAFTA prior to the holdovers, so it's not like he's overdue there, but yeah, I don't know why he was snubbed for the year that Sideways came out. But he has won the Critics' Choice Award and the Golden Globe in the musical comedy category, so I can't rule him out winning at the BAFTAs. He's got the momentum right now, and there's every chance he could ride that wave to a victory at BAFTA as well. I'm gonna say this now, if Paul Giamatti does end up winning the BAFTA, then I think that's highly indicative that he's gonna go all the way and sweep the rest of awards season at SAG and the Oscars. Because BAFTA really does feel like his biggest obstacle to overcome, but Killian Murphy has the added advantage of being the lead performance in, you know, the Best Picture frontrunner at BAFTA. Part of me really wants Best Actor to be a race, and if Paul Giamatti wins at BAFTA, then it's not really a race anymore, so yeah, Killian Murphy needs to win here, so it feels like more of a race going into Oscars night. At the moment, this is how I'm feeling. I think Killian Murphy wins at BAFTA, then Paul Giamatti will probably win at SAG, and then it's gonna come down to the wire at Oscars, but I feel like Paul Giamatti might just have the edge at Oscars, but this is BAFTAs we're talking about, and I think it's gonna go to Killian Murphy, so he's who I'm predicting to win at BAFTA. Next up, we have Actress in a Leading Role, and I think this one is much tougher to call than Best Actor. There's probably some of you thinking, how is this more difficult to call? Lily Gladstone isn't here, Emma Stone's surely gonna win this because the narrative all season long has been the battle of the stones between Lily Gladstone and Emma Stone, and if Gladstone's not here, then Emma Stone's already won this. Yes, that makes a lot of sense. I agree, like Emma Stone could very easily win this because Poor Things is a heavily nominated film at BAFTA and yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense that she would win here, but I don't think it's a done deal. I do think she has some competition and I think that competition mostly comes from Sandra Hula for Anatomy of a Fall. But besides Sandra Hula, is there anybody else in this category that could give Emma Stone a run for her money? Some I've seen some people try to make the argument for Kerry Mulligan online and I can kind of understand why. Like Maestro did all right at BAFTA, got like seven nominations, but I'm just not sure there's enough passion behind Maestro for it to win anything. I'm not really predicting it to win anything at BAFTAs actually, not even hair and makeup, but more on that later. But yeah, Kerry Mulligan, I understand, yeah, she's an English actress and like she, you know, has been nominated before. Um, maybe some people are saying she might be a little bit more overdue than Emma Stone, because Emma Stone did win for La La Land back in what, 2017, but yeah, Poor Things just has so much more going for it. it, has more nominations and there's more visible passion for it. So yeah, I feel like Emma Stone is more likely to win. But no, I don't see anyone surprising here like Fantasia Barino or Margot Robbie or Vivian Oprah. Like, I, the only person who I think is a credible chance of, you know, spoiling here is Sandra Hula for her performance as Sandra in Anatomy of a Fall. I've been saying for a few weeks now that I genuinely think Sandra Hula is a dark horse to go all the way and win Best Actress at the Oscars. And if that is, you know, if this theory is gonna be real, then it kinda needs to start at BAFTA. And I think it could start here. So I'm gonna justify why I think she could win at BAFTA. Okay, so first of all, Anatomy of a Fall did very well at BAFTA, okay? It got seven nominations this film, all in critical categories. So you've got Best Film, Film Not in the English Language, Best Director, Screenplay, 
editing, and of course, Sandra Hula for Best Actress. Okay, all of that is a solid package, okay? That's what you need to win Best Picture, ideally. But Hula herself has also had an incredible year, a real breakout year of sorts, 2023 was for her, because she's in two Best Picture movies at the Oscars, and now at the BAFTAs, she's double nominated for two roles, one for you know, Anatomy for the Best Actress and one for Supporting Actress in The Zone of Interest, okay? Like, she is really hot right now. People are, like, waking up to the talents of Sandra Hula, okay? She's being celebrated. Just a little side note, the last time we got a double Best Actress, Supporting Actress nomination for the same person was Scarlett Johansson in 2019. Okay, back to my point. <laughs> but yeah, the fact that Sandra Hula managed to get two acting nominations in the same year really does illustrate that she does have a lot of support from the European voters at BAFTA. Could she be like an Emmanuel Riva for Amour or Marion Cotillard for Le Vion Rose? BAFTA is more likely to give Best Actress to a non-English speaking performance than say the Oscars are. And between the two films that she's nominated for, The Zone of Interest and All of the Strangers, those two films combined have 16 nominations. So maybe some BAFTA voters will be thinking, well, maybe we should be championing Sandra Hula here. A win for Anatomy makes more sense than The Zone of Interest because of her previous nominations at Golden Globe and Critics' Choice for Anatomy. She did miss at SAG for Anatomy before, but she was kind of expected to miss there because they very rarely nominate performances that aren't primarily in the English language. But what really makes me think that Sandra Hula could pull off a surprise win at BAFTA is that her performance in Anatomy Before really does feel like a performance that BAFTA would go for. It's really giving me like Kate Blanchett in Tar vibes. And obviously Kate Blanchett won a BAFTA last year for Best Actress. Like the two performances about complex, questionable women who make questionable choices and they're very layered performances, they're multilingual. So yeah, there's a lot of dexterity going on with these performances and that BAFTA tend to acknowledge more than uh, say Michelle Yeoh in Everything Ever All At Once who was like the presumed front runner. But yeah, again, that was sort of a, a sci-fi quirky movie. And yeah, in a way, Poor Things is also a sci-fi quirky movie. The same with um, Emma Stone's performance as Bella Baxter. Still would be an absolutely deserved win if Emma Stone does win. But I don't know, I feel like Anatomy of a Fall or Sandra in Anatomy of a Fall is more of a role that BAFTA would pick over Bella Baxter in Poor Things, but I can still see Bella Baxter winning here, but I feel like <laughs> that Sandra in Anatomy of a Fall is more their cup of tea. So with Anatomy of a Fall's nomination tally combined with Hula's double nomination, I do think there is a chance that she could have enough support to win at BAFTA in Best Actress. And if she does win at BAFTA, then she will have a shot at winning the Oscar. So yeah, if Sandra Hula wins at BAFTA, then the narrative of Best Actress this year will probably shift from the Battle of the Stones to a repeat of 2017 when Emma Stone was up against a renowned European actress, Isabelle Huppert, but Emma Stone triumphed there uh, over Isabelle Huppert. This time around, it will be Emma Stone again in another big Best Picture contender up against um, a renowned European actress, this time Sandra Hula. So yeah, it's kind of a, a repeat of uh, 2017. But that can only really happen though if Sandra Hula wins a BAFTA. But even though Isabelle Huppert couldn't triumph in 2017, I do think Sandra Hula stands a stronger chance of beating Emma Stone this year than Isabelle Huppert did in 2017. And that's for two reasons. One, um, Isabelle Huppert's performance was in uh, a film that wasn't nominated for Best, Best Picture. Sandra Hula's is, uh, and yeah, Emma Stone's that year was. It was La La Land. In fact, she was the only Best Actress nominee who was in a Best Picture uh, contender. So yeah, Isabelle Huppert had a disadvantage there. But also, uh, comparing um, Huppert to Hula, Hula's performance features a lot of her speaking in English. I'd say maybe, what, a quarter of the film, she is speaking in English. The fact that a good chunk of her performance is in English does make the film more accessible to certain voters. And yeah, we haven't had a primarily non-English speaking performance winning Best Actress at the Oscars since 2007 for Marion Cotillard. And I know that Michelle Yeoh did speak Cantonese and Mandarin in Everything Ever All at Once, but you know, the primary language was English and that was an American movie. Now granted, Hula isn't nominated at SAG, which does put her at a disadvantage because she can't win there and therefore, you know, give a speech at the last precursor, which might have a last minute knock-on effect before 
you know, final Oscar voting closes. But if she does win at BAFTA and gives a great speech, then she might do enough to carry that support over from BAFTA into Oscars night because BAFTA and um, Oscars do share a fair amount of voter overlap. So watch out for Sandra Hula. If she does win the BAFTA, then there is a pathway for her to win the Oscar, but she does need the BAFTA win in order to do so. But if Emma Stone does win the BAFTA, and there's a very good chance that she will, then she will be the one to beat at the Oscars, but she will have a considerable advantage going into Oscars night. So yeah, I feel like the safer prediction is to predict Emma Stone winning for poor things, you know, go with the momentum, but I wanna take a risk here and predict that Sandra Hula is gonna take the BAFTA. I really want that best actress race and a challenger could emerge at BAFTA if Sandra Hula wins for Anatomy of a Fall. So yeah, I'm predicting her to win the BAFTA. But yeah, if Emma Stone does win at the BAFTAs, that's awesome, it's very much deserved and that second Oscar is pretty much guaranteed for her at that point unless Lily Gladstone pulls off a win at SAC. Best animated feature? This one isn't as straightforward as the category looks. I can rule Elemental out, like it's just happy to be here. I'm glad I got the nomination, but it's not gonna win. But yeah, you've got two heavy hitters here, The Boy and the Heron and uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Yes, Chicken Run 2 is here and I get it. It's British, it's an Ardman film, it's a very beloved studio, but I don't think there is the same amount of passion for Dawn of the Nugget as there is the other two, The Boy and the Heron, Across the Spider-Verse, or even the first Chicken Run movie, and Dawn of the Nugget didn't even get in at the Oscars, which is very telling. So yeah, I'm rolling Chicken Run 2 out. But yeah, I can see it going either way between The Boy and the Heron and Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. On the one hand, you've got Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which its predecessor film, Into the Spider-Verse, ended up winning the BAFTA in 2018. And there's also a lot of passion for its sequel, so yes, I can definitely see it winning here. It also won the Critics' Choice Award as well. On the other hand, BAFTA may want to honor another cinematic legend in this category. They did it last year for Guillermo del Toro with Pinocchio, and supposedly The Boar and the Heron might be the final ever movie from master animator and filmmaker Hayao Miyazaki. So maybe they'll feel more inclined to give him some acknowledgement because they may not get another chance. But remember, they are just rumors. It might not actually be his final ever film. I think it's pretty close, but I'm gonna go with Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse because it did get the nomination for best original score. It has one more nomination than The Boy and the Heron, which I think gives it a slight advantage. Next up is best British animated short. Now, just for the record, I I haven't actually seen any of these shorts, but I have watched the trailers today, which is what I'm basing my prediction off. My knee-jerk reaction to this category was to go for Crab Day, simply because um, the last three years in this category, it's gone to a film which you know features an animal name in the title. So think the boy, the fox, the mole, and the horse, or do not feed the pigeons, or the owl and the pussycat. And from looking at the trailer of Crab Day, it's very cute. It's minimal and expressionistic, but also kind of charming too. Then there's Wild Summon, which got the nomination at Cannes for Palm d'Or for Best Short Film. It didn't win, but it seems to have made a splash. I watched the trailer today and it looks very striking, a little bit weird, and there is an environmental message, it would seem. And then there's Visible Mending, which is so charming just from the trailer alone. It's a stop motion animation that's like in the style of a documentary about these knitted or crocheted creatures or items like mice or teddy bears. And the knitted creatures are talking as if they are the people who are knitting them, saying how they are helping to mend themselves, you know, knitting themselves together again. It's not as hard hitting as the other two, but it still does have a sweet message in there. Honestly, it's a tough one to call, but my instinct is telling me to go with invisible mending. It's charming, it's quintessentially British with the whole knitting aspect. It tugs at the heartstrings, or in this case, the wool strings. So yeah, I'm gonna go with visible mending, but I don't feel confident on this prediction. Next up is Best British Short Film, and again, I haven't seen any of these films, so sorry, I've just been so busy, I haven't had time to check them out, but yeah, my instinct is to go for Yellow, because I thought Yellow was gonna get into Best Short at the Oscars, it didn't, but yeah, I still think like it could win uh, at the BAFTAs, so yeah. That's what I'm going for here. Next up is Best Original Screenplay, and I think this one is going to be an interesting category because Barbie has officially moved from Best Original Screenplay to Best Adapted at the Oscars, and I'm wondering, is that going to affect 
BAFTA voters and how they're gonna predict original screenplay. Are they gonna go with Barbie in original now? I'm not so sure because the Critics' Choice did go for um, Barbie for best original screenplay, but very rarely do the BAFTAs and Critics' Choice like match up. Like last year, BAFTA went with Banshees and Critics' Choice went with Everything Ever All At Once. And the year before that, Critics' Choice went with Belfast and BAFTA went with Licorice Pizza. I can see it going to any of the films nominated here apart from Maestro. But yeah, I could see it going to Anatomy, Barbie, Holdovers or Past Lives. Again, the Holdovers did quite well at BAFTA and I can see the Holdovers winning kind of like how Licorice Pizza won in that it's no, a movie set in the 70s and the dialogue is very spunky. Uh, and also like this would go to David Hemmingson and not uh, Alexander Payne who's come under a little bit of heat recently. So yeah, I could see the holdovers winning this. Anatomy of a Fall got the Golden Globe for best screenplay and is surging right now. Past Lives is beloved and if it's gonna win any Oscar, its best chance would be for best original screenplay. But if it's gonna happen winning at the Oscars, it would need to win a BAFTA. So BAFTA would need to make it happen. But Barbie really does feel like the most out there original film of the category this year. Like I know, yes, it is a movie based around the IP of a doll Barbie, but what Greta Gerwig and Noah Baumbach did with the story was very, original, unique, and unexpected. It's also the script out of these five, which has definitely made the biggest impact. Culturally, I mean, not emotionally. Like, past lives hit so much harder emotionally. At least it did for me, anyways. My instinct is telling me to go for Anatomy of a Fall because it seems a little bit more serious than the holdovers. Like, the BAFTAs like to hold themselves up as having, like, really superior taste sometimes. And I'm just not sure if uh, enough of the voters will view the sweet, cuddly, cozy Christmas movie <laughs> as more serious fare than the thrilling courtroom drama Anatomy of a Fall. My heart is actually saying to go for past lives because part of me really wants to believe that the collective mentality of the BAFTA votership wants to go for past lives and give it something somewhere. Of course, there's no evidence to suggest that at all and it seems foolish to predict past lives, but there's a little part of me that thinks maybe it could happen. But yeah, I'm still not convinced that it's going to happen, but I would love, love, love to see past lives pull off a surprise win here. I just don't have the confidence or the balls to say that it's definitely gonna win uh, best original screenplay. So yeah, I'm gonna go with what I think is a slightly safer prediction and predict uh, Anatomy of a Fall to win here. Best adapted screenplay. Now, there is a part of me here which thinks that BAFTAs might do their own thing and give it to Andrew Haig for All of Us Strangers. That film has been surging here for the past few weeks. Like, people have really been talking about All of Us Strangers. There is so much adoration for that film and there's part of me that thinks that maybe that could result in a screenplay win for Andrew Haig. It's already won the best screenplay at the British Independent Film Awards as well. But yeah, All of Us Strangers doesn't feel like an assured prediction in this category. I know American Fiction has a great screenplay but this was the only nomination that American Fiction received at BAFTA, illustrating that it's not as much of a hot property here at BAFTA than it is across the pond, so I don't think it's gonna win Best Adapted Screenplay. At least, not at BAFTA anyways. Oppenheimer, I know it's the BAFTA's darling this year, but I don't think they're gonna be like, okay, let's give Christopher Nolan everything. He's getting Best Director, he's probably gonna get Best Film, so I think they're probably gonna wanna spread the love around. Plus, I don't really think of Oppenheimer as a screenplay movie, even though the screenplay is fantastic. It's more of a achievement in direction and the tech department side. But for me, I do think there's better examples of writing in this category. I also don't think it's the writing that jumps out at voters for the zone of interest as well. It is a good screenplay, but the writing isn't as deliciously grabby as say, all of Us Strangers, or American Fiction, or Poor Things. I think Tony McNamara makes a lot of sense to win here for Poor Things. Poor Things has 11 nominations, okay? It's clearly an appreciated film. Tony McNamara has won previously in Best Original Screenplay for The Favourite, which was another Lampamas film, so they clearly do like his writing. And after I rewatched Poor Things last week, there were so many profound and poignant bits of dialogue which really stood out to me as I was watching it. Like, I'm a flawed, experimenting person. Or Swiney's speech to Bella about how we must experience everything, not just the good, but 
degradation, horror, sadness. That's what makes us whole, Bella. That's what makes us creatures of substance, not flighty, untouched children. Then we can know the world, and when we know the world, the world is ours. And also, who could forget, I must go punch that baby. <laughs> and yes, the writing in Poor Things might be a little bit more blue than the favorite was, but the writing really does come alive off the page and onto the screen in Poor Things. So I think they are gonna go for Tony McNamara for Poor Things for Best Adapted Screenplay. Best Documentary. I'm going with 20 Days in Mariupol. It got the PGA Best Doc Nom and it got in at the Oscars as well. It's also very topical and timely given that it's about Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's just a little bit more urgent than a documentary about Wham! or Michael J. Fox. I feel like if anything's gonna surprise it, it might be beyond utopia, but 20 Days in Mariupol makes so much more sense to me. Best film, not in the English language. I actually think this is gonna be a pretty close one. Either Anatomy of a Fall continues its sweep, or The Zone of Interest manages to win here because it's got the home turf advantage of it being a English film, and yeah, this is probably how they would best award Jonathan Glazer if they really wanna give him a BAFTA. But I'm still gonna predict Anatomy of a Fall to win in this category because one, it's a little bit more accessible than The Zone of Interest is. And two, uh, Anatomy of a Fall is also nominated for Best Film at BAFTA and uh, The Zone of Interest isn't, which I think gives it a slight edge. It just indicates there's a little bit more passion for Anatomy of a Fall if it got into Best Film and The Zone of Interest didn't. But yeah, it wouldn't be all that surprising if The Zone of Interest managed to pull off a win here. Next up is Best Casting, and in the four years that this has been a category at the BAFTAs, I have correctly guessed this category zero times. This category has only been in existence since 2019, so we've only got four years worth of stats. I've not been able to figure out a pattern here yet as to what BAFTA considers to be the best casting of each year. The four recipients of this award have been Joker, Rocks, West Side Story, and Elvis. There's not much there in terms of patterns we can gauge or common occurrences. They're all very different films from one another. But yeah, when I was looking at those four previous winners, the only things where I could kind of like lump them together were the fact that Joker and Elvis were both films that centered around one big sensational performance, like getting the casting of that one main character just right. Rocks, on the other hand, was a relatively low budget ensemble film, but it also was released during the pandemic. And then there's West Side Story, which is a Spielberg musical, which does have a diverse range of performances, but the film wasn't nominated for Best Picture or anything. So yeah, it's really hard to know what they consider to be the best casting. Like, there's no rhyme or reason between all these winners in this category. I could see Oliver Strangers or How to Have Sex here winning in the same way that Rox did. It could go to How to Have Sex because it did win Best Casting at Biffa, the British Independent Film Awards, and Rox also won Best Casting during its year, so maybe How to Have Sex will be a repeat of Rox's victory. I am kind of surprised that The Holdovers made it into this category because it pretty much is just a three-person ensemble, that film, but the casting of that film was essential to The Holdovers' success, and it is a remarkable piece of casting, really, and all three of those performances went on to be nominated individually at BAFTA as well. Killers did make a lot of sense to me, that was until I realized that BAFTA didn't even nominate Lily Gladstone or Leonardo DiCaprio for Best Actor or Best Actress, which makes me think, why would they give it the win for Best Casting if they're not going to acknowledge the two lead performances from that film? So yeah, the snub of Gladstone and, to a lesser extent, Leonardo DiCaprio has really thrown me off there, but is Killers of the Power Moon going to go home empty-handed on BAFTA night? It, it could be quite likely unless they feel obliged to just give it casting so Killers of the Flower Moon wins something. Yeah, if Killers did manage to pull off a win for casting at BAFTAs, then I wouldn't be upset because the casting is phenomenal in Killers. It's just the exclusion of Gladstone and DiCaprio makes it hard to believe that they're gonna go for it. And Oliver Strangers has two performances from the film nominated, but not the lead for Andrew Scott, which is so baffling, which just adds more confusion to the mix, but that film is just so beautifully casted. Everyone is pitch perfect in that film. Everyone's performances harmonize with each other so beautifully. And then part of me thinks that Anatomy of a Fall could win this in the same way that Joker and Elvis won in this category. Because Anatomy is one of those films that's bolstered up by a core central performance, which is 
a tour de force of acting from Sandra Hula, and also the supporting players are also terrific in this, and it would be so lovely if Anatomy did win this, because then Milo Mercado Grana would sort of be acknowledged, you know, for his amazing performance, and he's been overlooked the whole of awards season, justice for Milo. But we've not seen a film that's primarily not in the English language win in this category yet, but there's no reason to say that it can't happen now. But again, part of me thinks that because Anatomy is surging right now, then Anatomy could win casting. Sandra Hula got the nomination for Best Actress at BAFTA, and it does feel like Sandra Hula is to Anatomy before what uh, Austin Butler was to Elvis, or Joaquin Phoenix was to Joker, in that they are the critical pieces of casting that needed to be spot on in order for the movie to work as well as it does. And yeah, they got the casting absolutely perfect with Sandra Hula. It's one of those roles where you can't see any other actor on the planet doing it as well as they do. Honestly though, I have no confidence in my prediction here. Like if Oppenheimer actually did get nominated in this casting category, then I probably would have predicted Oppenheimer because again, that feels like the whole Elvis Joker argument that that one main character casting is so critical to the movie's success and you know, they absolutely slayed it with Killian Murphy, but yeah. Didn't get nominated for casting, so now I'm like, who do I even try to decide is gonna win this? So yeah, I'm gonna go with my instinct and predict Anatomy of a Fall to win Best Casting. It kind of supports my theory of Sandra Hula winning in Best Actress as well. But again, I won't be surprised if I am totally wrong in my prediction here and it goes to literally anything else. I could see any one of the five winning here. That's how hard it is to predict Best Casting at BAFTA. Best Makeup and Hair. Now, BAFTA do like their prosthetics, but they didn't go for the showier use of prosthetics last year, which was the whale, which is why I think they might actually end up snubbing Maestro here, which is definitely the showier use of prosthetics, and go for something a little bit more subtler, like uh, the transformation of Killian Murphy's Oppenheimer, slowly getting older. So yeah, I think they might actually go for Oppenheimer here. Again, it comes back to the argument that hair and makeup usually is paired with like a actor's performance that wins, and with Austin Butler winning in this category last year, and then Elvis also winning uh, hair and makeup, it does make the argument a little bit more assured that if Killian Murphy wins Best Actor, then they might award the makeup and hair team that slowly showed him getting older throughout the movie. Yeah, I'm gonna predict that Oppenheimer wins in hair and makeup. Costume design. This will be interesting to see what the outcome is here at BAFTA. Barbie is the front runner to win at the Oscars for costume design, but uh, poor things, its closest competitor is a British film and has more nominations at BAFTAs and could surprise here. Holly Waddington did the costumes on Poor Things and she's really made a name for herself by doing a lot of the work on Bridgerton. And there's no denying that the constructions of her garments for Poor Things do seem a lot more elaborate than those in Barbie. They're very avant-garde and require a lot of construction. There was actually an exhibition in London not too long ago of all the costumes from Poor Things. And yeah, some of these outfits, they just take your breath away when you see them up close. I'm like, damn, I wanna be Emma Stone and get to wear all these costumes. <laughs> And I can see BAFTA going for poor things over Barbie here. But I will say Barbie definitely can win the BAFTA for costume design. Like they do love Jacqueline Duran. And in so many ways, you know, Barbie does feel like a showcase of outfits. Again, I have done a deep dive discussion on the battle between Barbie and poor things in production design and costume design. I'll pop a link up here if you want my full analysis on why it's gonna be so close. But yeah, for costume design, my gut is saying it's gonna to go to poor things at BAFTA and then Barbie will win at the Oscars. So yeah, I'm gonna predict that it goes to Holly Waddington for Poor Things at BAFTA. Next up is production design. And again, this is the Poor Things versus Barbie battle here. I could see this going either way, but I do think this is one of the categories where Barbie is going to win. Barbie Land was such an accomplishment. Barbie Land was constructed and shot here in London, okay? People love that production design. It was bold, colorful, imaginative. It's one of those movies where you really want to go visit the location of it all because it looks so inviting. Granted, the production design of Poor Things was also very out there and impressive, but no other film of 2023 really springs to mind as faster when I think of world building production design like Barbie did. I'm predicting Barbie wins production design at BAFTA. Next up we have Best Sound. Oppenheimer, duh. Like the film 
has an atomic bomb in it, okay? Need I say more? Let's move on. <laughs> Cinematography. I mean, Oppenheimer, again. Come on, Hoyt Van Hoytma, it is yours to collect. Moving swiftly on, editing. <laughs> and again, Oppenheimer again. Jennifer Lame can't be tamed, okay? She is winning for editing. That's like a triple whammy of Oppenheimer wins, and it just makes sense because these are like the easiest categories to call. If anybody else wins in any of those three categories, I will be shocked. Best special visual effects, which sounds incorrect when I say it out loud, but that's the name of the category. This is harder than I thought because Oppenheimer wasn't nominated here, and normally Christopher Nolan movies do dominate in the visual effects category, like uh, Inception, uh, Interstellar, Tennis, they all won here, but yeah, Oppenheimer wasn't nominated. The only best picture contender in this category is Poor Things, but I'm not sure that BAFTA would go for it because visual effects don't really spring to mind when I think of Poor Things. The visual effects in Poor Things are more used for refining more than anything. I can't see BAFTA going for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. Mission Impossible would be a cool win. A lot of people have seen it. Napoleon also could win here. It did all right at BAFTA. It got four nominations which means people have seen it and I know not everybody loves the film but the, the nominations do imply that they do have some respect for certain departments of the film. So I could see Napoleon winning in this category. The creator would actually be my pick to win in this category because the visual effects on the AI little girl character were seamless but I'm not sure if enough people have seen the creator. It's just not as buzzy as some of the other films in this category, which makes me feel like it's probably more likely to go to Napoleon or Mission Impossible. It might be a bit of a bold pick, but I'm actually gonna predict that Mission Impossible wins in best visual effects because it was a big summer blockbuster movie uh, with a lot of jaw-dropping stunts and lots of people went to go see it. Probably more so than Napoleon, I think. When I factor in the word special to the special visual effects title of this category, it does make me think about the practicality of the set pieces in Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. Like, they actually crashed a train for real in Derbyshire, and it made the national news, so it had good exposure, and it makes me think that it's gotta be Mission Impossible, right? So yeah, I'm gonna be bold with this prediction and go with Mission Impossible. Best Supporting Actress, uh, not too much to discuss here. It looks very likely that Divine Joy Randolph is gonna continue her sweep in this category. If anybody else won, it would be a shock at this point. But yeah, Divine Joy Randolph has been an unstoppable force in this category this year, so I think she's winning the BAFTA. Imagine though if this is where they decided to award Sandra Hula for Best Supporting Actress for Zone of Interest, not Anatomy of a Fall. That would be Gagatronic. I would love to see Claire Foy win here. That would be my wish pick in this category, but I don't think it's gonna happen. This is, after all, the year of divine joy. Best Supporting Actor it's gotta be Robert Downey Jr. for Oppenheimer. He's also having his moment like Divine and I think he's gonna continue his sweep here. He's part of the Oppenheimer bundle and I feel more assured about Robert Downey Jr. winning for supporting actor than I do Killian Murphy for lead actor. If someone were to surprise in this category, say Ryan Gosling for Barbie, and then yeah, that would be a gag and it would certainly make the race a little bit more interesting going into Oscars, but yeah, I don't think it's gonna happen. I feel pretty confident that Robert Downey Jr. is going home with the BAFTA. Outstanding debut by a British writer, director, or producer. This category is chosen by a jury of industry experts and not the whole BAFTA voting membership. Last year, it felt very obvious who was gonna win this category. Charlotte Wells for After Sun just made so much sense, but this year it's not as clear, I'd say. Uh, I think it's even gonna come down to how to Have Sex, or Blue Bag Life. How to Have Sex won the Uncertain Regard Prize at Cannes, and also won a few prizes at Biffa, which were lead performance and casting. Molly Manning Walker did lose to Andrew Haig for Best Director at Biffa, but that does make sense because Andrew Haig is more established than Molly Manning Walker. That was on her debut, and yeah, All of Us Strangers was a much bigger film. Last year, After Sun dominated at Biffa, kind of like All of Us Strangers this year. And given that How to Have Sex was Molly Manning Walker's debut, it makes sense why she would lose to a more renowned, regarded filmmaker like Andrew Haig. But I do think if All of Us Strangers wasn't How to Have Sex's main competitor that year, it would have won more awards at Biffa. So yeah, I'm gonna go with How to Have Sex, but I do think Blue Bag Life could end up winning here. Outstanding British film. I think I've said before that usually the winner of this category is the film that is the biggest film that's nominated for Best Picture at the Oscars. So think The Banshees of Inner Sharon, 
Belfast, 1917, The Favourite. So logic dictates that Poor Things is gonna win in this category because it has the most nominations out of this bunch of films at both BAFTA and the Oscars. It's also up for best film at BAFTA. No other nominees in this category are. But I do think there is like a teeny tiny chance that maybe all of us strangers could surprise here and win best British film because of how much love there is for that film. And it did pretty well with its nominations. Uh, but yeah, it's probably not gonna happen because it's not nominated for best picture at the Oscars. And yeah, Poor Things is the logical pick. So yeah, I'm predicting Poor Things. Uh, yeah. <laughs> best director. I am so happy that Andrew Haig is in this category. It's much deserved, but he's not gonna win, sadly. It's not his time. In fact, it's another British filmmaker's time. It is, of course, Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer. This is Nolan's year, okay? He has been sweeping the season, collecting all those director trophies. Much deserved. He has been so overdue for so long. Isn't it kind of balmy to think that Christopher Christopher Nolan, one of the biggest names in cinema, has never won a BAFTA award? Isn't that kind of crazy, considering how he's such a household name? Yeah, it just doesn't seem right, does it? But hey, at least they're about to rectify that this year. But yeah, Oppenheimer shows no signs of slowing down. It is the big technical achievement in direction this year. But yeah, Nolan just ticks all the right boxes. It's his home turf, he's overdue. His film is the most nominated film at BAFTAs. He's a respected and renowned filmmaker. And you know what, he just flipping deserves it. That's why. So yeah, it's going to Christopher Nolan. And last but not least, we have Best Film, and this is a fantastic category. We've got five amazing films here. Oppenheimer makes the most sense to win here, okay? It's won at the Golden Globes and the Critics' Choice Awards, so yeah, it has the momentum. It's the film with the most BAFTA nominations this year with 13. Last year, it was All Quiet on the Western Front with 14. That ended up winning the most awards on the night, including Best Film. It's a front runner for Best Picture at the Oscars, and a win for Best Film at BAFTAs will certainly help solidify its chances of being the eventual best picture winner at the Oscars. Again, it just makes sense as well that if Christopher Nolan is like a lock for best director, then you would think Oppenheimer makes a natural pairing for best picture as well. But could we see a surprise here? I'd like to entertain the idea that Poor Things could win here, but Poor Things is pretty much a lock to win best British film. So there's less incentive to, you know, crown it twice if it's already winning in best um, British film. And a lot of people really do love Oppenheimer, so I don't know why they'd want to award Poor Things twice. Plus, Yorgos Santamos was shockingly snubbed in Best Director, so that doesn't help. And it's a similar problem for Killers of the Flower Moon. Like, it managed to receive nine BAFTA nominations, but it missed in some critical categories, like Best Actor, Best Actress, Best Screenplay, and Best Director for Martin Scorsese. So yeah, Win for Killers doesn't seem very likely to me. The Holdover's got a lot of critical nominations. It got three for acting, it got screenplay, and oh, shockingly in for Best Director as well. Could it surprise? Hmm. Perhaps, but I don't know if enough BAFTA members would feel convinced enough to give the holdovers the top prize, which is, you know, a sweet, feel-good, Christmassy character study movie over a epic, historical Christopher Nolan movie. I just don't know if I see BAFTA going that way, especially when uh, Oppenheimer has so many more nominations. But Anatomy of a Fall might actually be Oppenheimer's biggest threat for best film because it got into all of the major categories. It got director, screenplay, uh, best actress for Sandra Hula, and it also got best editing. Editing is actually a lot more essential than people realize, okay? It's a big part of making a movie. So yes, it's better to have the editing nomination than to not have it. Plus a foreign language film did manage to win in this category just last year. We've all quite in the Western front. It won film not in the English language and also won best film. So it can be done. I'm pretty confident Anatomy of Fall is gonna win film not in the English language and it has a good chance of winning best actress, best screenplay and best casting. So it's gonna do well on BAFTA's night, but I, I just don't think it's gonna quite be Oppenheimer for best film. Like it does have everything it needs to win best film, but Oppenheimer just has everything it needs and more, okay? It just makes so much more sense. And it's been collecting so many top prizes uh, over award seasons. It has everything going for it. It's a bigger competitor and it hasn't missed anywhere. It's a safer, more logical pick for best film at BAFTA. I'm predicting that it's gonna be the biggest winner at BAFTA. I'm predicting it to win in eight categories this year. That's one more than All Quiet on the Western Front last year. 
And yeah, I'm predicting that Chris Finnon's Oppenheimer is gonna win best film at the 2024 BAFTAs. But as always guys, just one bloke's opinion. I wanna know what do you think of my BAFTA nominations and what are your BAFTA predictions? Let me know in the comment section down below. If you have enjoyed this video, help me out with a little thumbs button. If you guys want more movie TV and Oscars related content, don't forget to click subscribe. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. For more things related to movies, TV, the Oscars and popcorn culture, I'm Luke Airfield and I'll see you next time. And that's what happens when I throw my left. <laughs> Shambles.